So the world of waste is complex. Compostables are no exception to the rule um, for many reasons. Um, none other than that they offer, um, we want to offer alternatives to plastics. Um, and we must encourage the use um, for compostable products in our day-to-day -day life. And that's why we're here. So um, we're going to provide a, our overview. Um, Susan Toman has come from Gig Harbor to, I mean, Port Orchard <laughs> to join us. And um, so we'll see your presentation. Then we'll have time for um, questions and comments and talk about our zero waste intent for uh, compostables. And I just realized if you go to the Zoom, you can watch them on the phone. So yeah. this is too hard. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Susan. You're she welcome. is um, from Compost Manufacturing Alliance and she's a managing director. So we welcome her. Let me share my screen here. Okay. <coughs> can those of you in Zimland see the screen? I can see her. <laughs> well, you can. Okay. So I'm, can you see it over there? Okay. Well, thanks for having me today. I'm just across the pond in Port Orchard, moved out to Kitsap Peninsula about 12 years ago. Love it out here. And I lived the fairy life, or did, uh, for a long time. I worked for Cedar Grove over there for 14 years and did a lot of their, what I call the connecting stuff, you know, working with cities and counties and trying to solve problems and business development and finding win-wins. So one of the things that happened along the way was, um, I started working with packaging companies because around 2009, Seattle went out with their food scrap program, co-mingled food scraps, and then you had all the commercial entities like Microsoft and the University of Washington all wanting to use compostable. So our experience was at the time when I was there that uh, we had all these um, standards for compostables that were mostly lab standards, and those lab standards you know, we're excellent, we needed them. They tell us that it's safe, it doesn't contain a lot of toxins. We do metals tests, we make sure it biodegrades to biomass and water and doesn't just fragment into microplastics. So all those lab standards are really important. But the one thing that wasn't uh, part of the equation back then was how does it actually work at a compost facility? So what Cedar Grove did is they were getting all these materials in um, from lots and lots of campuses. And when you think about it, pre-COVID days, you know, you could have a campus, a University of Washington campus, there's 60,000 meals a day. And then you add in, you know, the University of, or the Microsoft campus and Amazon, and that could be 200,000 meals a day where the packaging's coming in. And if it's not breaking down within the active composting cycle, it's just taking a really long ride to the landfill at the composter's expense. So we started field testing to deal with that at Cedar Grove. And over the years, um, we kind of, I always say, we kind of became the forced gump of compostables. <laughs> we started doing the testing for our own preservation, our own business model preservation. But also what was happening, the lab standards were made in the 90s when really all you had were windrow systems. And those windrow systems would go for six months at a time but as you added food scraps, there was a much higher level of control needed in the process. Um, and, and that shortened the active composting cycle. So, so this really developed at, um, at uh, Cedar Grove. I wonder why this isn't working. <laughs> Hold on a sec. Um, there we go. Um, and right now what we have is there's a lot of drivers for even more compostables nationally. So we're a national company. I'll, I'll, I'll move on to that. But we want to minimize plastic pollution. We want to make, you know, if we can create soil from the food scraps that we get in packaging, that's awesome. Uh, we're not going to waste it in the landfill. Um, we can, um, it's a, lots of science out now. In fact, we have our, our new bill in our state that passed. First time around the Climate uh, Act, um, we have legislation now to really look at composting and all the benefits for climate change mitigation. Um, and we keep it in our own communities. I mean, that that's the cool thing about composting is we make it in our communities from our own 
byproducts and we get to use it in our yards. And that is a highly sustainable model. So what we developed uh, from the time I left Cedar Grove to the time I started CMA, I, we, I actually started it because we started getting calls from all over the country because we were really leading the nation in Seattle. And a lot of it also came from Seattle Public Utilities leadership, a lot of the legislation, a lot of the programs they put together, and all the cities and haulers that worked with us. Um, but what happened over time is more and more composters were having the same issue across the country. Um, and I just was compelled as a person, uh, last chapter of my career, hopefully, try and make a difference. And I just asked Cedar Grove and five or six other major composters in the country if you wanted to partner with me to create a standard nationally that would help all the systems across the country. So I do work at a little old Port Orchard. We're a global company. Um, we're one of only two certifiers in the country. Uh, we have requests from Brazil, um, other countries that I can't even name because they got me under an NDA. But there's this concept is really traveling globally right now because we're kind of at chapter two with food scraps and composting and how do we do it right. So what we try to do is really educate that the supply chain folks that make packaging and the solid waste systems and communities like yours that want to do the composting, you know, we're all part of the same system. If your deli wrap ends up in the bin and goes to a compost facility, you just became part of our system. So what we're really trying to bang the drum on is we can't treat the system separately. We can't just go in the lab and create a product and throw it on the market and say, we're all good, unless that composter has a say in it too. So that's really what I do. I work for composters all over North America to help them come up with um, lists of things that work for them. Because at the end of the day, most of these companies and cities that they work with are public-private partnerships. And at the end of the day, we want composting to grow. We want them to be you know, solvent, we want them to, you know, continue to, you know, get more feedstocks, but we have to make sure that we're not hurting their business model. So I like to say we take the traditional one-size-fits-all model where you just take it in a lab with highly controlled conditions and throw it on the shelf and put a logo on it. We're actually trying to make it part of a solid waste system. So that's, you know, it's a systems approach to compostable. So I have partners all over the country, as I said. Uh, one of them just became the largest in the country, We Care, Denali. And uh, they're pretty, pretty, they're in acquisition mode. So they're buying up, they bought up the largest organics hauler in the country. And anyway, so the good news is we have a lot of scale with this program now. Because we have, you know, the best of the best on our team. And we're finding that's part of why we have a lot of demands for what we do. Um, our affiliate network, um, this is our affiliate network. We are the standard for the Staten Island facility in New York City, the Phoenix facility at Santa Ana Phoenix for Chicago, um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, we'll be working in Hawaii to be the standard in Hawaii. Um, and of course, uh, we've been the standard a long time through Cedar Grove in Seattle for their facility. So again, a growing concept, but the goal is we're trying to connect all these things, do it in an efficient way so that all of us can connect like your program, this is the list that works for your process, and then we're all kind of working together. Um, I like to also, you know, you folks probably know a lot more about the composting process than product designers of spoons. So I spend a lot of my time, you know, really trying to get them to understand what it looks like to make compost. You know, it's really interesting that so many packaging designers in the compostable space have never been to a composting plant Okay, so we say, meet us at the piles and let's have a chat. Okay, and we do it all over the country. And it's amazing, some really big brands are now like, wow, why didn't we do this 10 years ago? Because it makes sense, right? You're in business with the composter. You're in business with the Vashon if you're doing your own composting. You got to have a relationship that makes sure it's working for everybody. So we've been really proud that we've grown that way. Um, and we're learning a lot too about how packaging, I would say that we probably know more about how packaging is made in Little Old Port Orchard than anybody because we get all the, the documents and everything that shows us the constituencies and everything else. So it's pretty pretty exciting little thing that we're doing. So I like to show them just how composting works, why you can't 
you know, why guys aren't going to jump off the loader 20 feet in the air and look for a logo to make sure it's okay. That's not how it works. It's a lot of volume. Um, and I'll talk a little bit, you know, toward the end about some of the things that we've influenced with a lot of the leaders in our state to make sure we have legislation to help us with a better system for that. Uh, but I like to say that let's work manufacturer to manufacturer. Composters are manufacturers. They make a product that they want to sell and they want you to come back and buy it over and over and over again. And if you start stop buying it and the inbound tonnages are increasing, that could really create a problem. So we've got to create high quality compost. We have to make sure people want to buy it and, and we have to grow that market as the inbound tonnage is growing. So there's a lot of pressure on facilities to do it well and make sure we can keep growing the system. So these are just pictures of, you know, the Cedar Grove system. This is, uh, I believe this is St. Louis, one of our facilities in St. Louis where they're taking out all the contaminants. But at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is not end up here where, you know, a large significant portion of materials are screened <laughs> out and have to be landfilled. The other thing that happens with that is, you know, you take all this careful sorting time and you make sure it's clean and, and your stuff gets mixed with the guy next door that doesn't care. And, and then the plastic's in there. And then the next thing you know, you lost all those organics too. Because at a certain point, it becomes so entrained in the organics that you have to landfill the organics too. And that's sad. Because, you know, a lot of people like you guys and me and a lot of people... We take a lot. So this is a big deal. We've got to get this right. So that's really what we're trying to do. Uh, that product is cured and aged. And, and really what's a bit unique about us is that we, we certify products to the process they are to the process they're in, their technologies. So if you do a windrow, a windrow system here, we do windrow testing all over the country. And what the net uh, windrow? Uh, Windrow, yeah, so it's basically like a big long row of compost feedstock and then much like your home compost pile, you just you need to aerate it, manage it, browns to greens, all that. But industrial wise, they're just big long ones, right? And I think, I don't know where the name came from, maybe because they sit in the wind, I don't know. But a windrow, I guess. So, but that's a lowest tech system, but that's where most programs start, whether they're in your community a lot of your Midwestern facilities are doing windrow. They're not as regulated in the Midwest than we are on the coast. So they don't need as much technology, um, but they're good systems. And when you manage them well, you can make great compost. So we test in a lot of windrow systems for a lot of our Midwestern facilities. Um, covered in vessel is the type Cedar Grove has. And what you're seeing is more and more of these systems going in in big cities. Why is that? They're very controlled, they're high tech. You know, they have covers on them. In-vessel means they're covered. Um, and so they have a 98% VOC and odor, you know, odor, um, you know, coverage. Um, so they're great systems for, for lots of volume that are in big cities where you have a lot of, you're not out in the middle of nowhere. Um, plus it makes great compost and it's very consistent. You know, you want to make a consistent product, just like coffee. There's a certain brand you like, a certain color certain style. Well, people are like that with their compost too. I was the director of marketing at Cedar Grove for seven years, so I know that really well. And they want that compost to be consistent, and that's one of the things that's great about high-tech composting systems. What's different though is a windrow system usually runs 90 to 180 days. These systems, they make compost in 49 to 60. So part of what happened from the time the lab standards for compostables were made and composters started taking the packaging 20 years later was the time frames got shorter. So the ASTM test that we do for making sure the product is safe and it meets all this other criteria, um, they haven't really caught up with modern systems. And we're seeing a lot, a lot of issues, or not a lot of issues, but we're seeing concerns in California now. They've got SB 1335 legislation and SB 1385, and you have a lot of short cycles. So, but they're managing more compostables into the system. So we're getting called from Cal Recycle and there's just so much going on right now, you guys, and there's a lot to figure out, but we're, we're really one of the solutions to that. And then aerated static pile, that's kind of a cross between your windrow. Uh, it's controlled, but it's static. 
and it will go 39 to 45 days and that's really short okay so these products were designed to break down in six months and if they don't break down in these they become contaminants because composters it, if you understand the way compost systems work industrial um, at the end of the process they screen out what didn't break down what they call the inert material and then they cure and age it so everything that didn't break down gets screened out and that's why, you know, if you spend 20% more on a compostable cup, only to have it get, get screened out and go to the landfill, everybody's, that's not a win-win. So that's what we're trying to build. Um, just some other things, again, the ASTM standards, I won't go into great detail, but um, there's ASTM standards in the U.S. 6400 is for monolayer materials, 6868 is for multi-layer materials, um, and then... Uh, and the Europeans have a standard as well. TUV is the, the certifier in Europe. Um, and they diverge when you get to multi-layer. Um, in, in the US, the ASTM standards say, if you have a coating, it has to pass biodegradation separate from the actual paper. Because what happens is it'll pick up the respiration from the paper and appear that it biodegrades. In Europe, they, they let you, they, in Europe it's different. So there is a difference between European and U.S. when you get to multi-layer, but that's what you have to pass for our standard. Um, and then we also have a parking lot of things that are just not, they don't really have an ASTM and they're still not where we need them to be, to be certified. And believe it or not, that would be like paper straws. Paper yeah. straws, everybody banned them. And then we found out later, they don't have a glue that's ASTM compliant. So they just came out with a glue. These are things we learned along the way. I always say, we're composters, we don't know this stuff. But then we find it out and go, whoa, okay. So now we are requiring everyone with the paper straw to use this new ASTM compliant glue. But all that happened after the big straw ban. <laughs> so, but anyway, so we have a parking lot for paper products that are really good, but not quite there. And then we have these certified uh, categories that uh, it need to meet. Also, PFAS, fluorinated chemicals, uh, big deal right now. Um, you, 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 you're all probably well aware of what PFAS are, but they bioaccumulate, they're toxic. Uh, we started working with the Green Policy Institute back in 2017. I traveled there when they started the, the program to really study this, BPI, the other certifiers, as well as uh, CNA. We have limits on how much total fluorine can be in a package uh, that's uh, allowed into our certification program. It's 100 parts per million total fluorine. That's the same as the other certifier. Um, and so you can't have any PFAS in ours uh, in, to be in our program. You can't have more than 100 parts per million. Can you explain what PFAS is? Um, I'm not a chemist, but it's polyfluorinated alkalids, uh, something like that. And it's used for grease resistant barriers in molded fiber, deli sheets, french fry bags. Our state was actually the first to ban them. But they have to find alternatives, and it's been a very slow process. So chemistry is interesting. It doesn't. It just doesn't take a week or two. It takes years to develop alternatives. So right now, I'll tell you, in the U.S., food trays for schools, molded fiber containers, there are very, very few available right now. So if you have an issue where you can't get molded fiber trays or the clamshells that look like paper, those are all probably PFAS laden materials. Mm -hmm. So it's a big deal and we have a huge gap in filling that category. Um, but I am not a chemist, but there's lots of stuff. You know who has a great website on it is the uh, well, okay. Center for Environmental Health in Berkeley. Go there and you can learn a lot. They have a great site. So field testing. Um, we literally go out with our cups, our plates, um, we mark them, we take photos of them before, we put them in the piles, um, we let them go through the whole process, um, and then we pull them out at the end. And uh, we take those fragments, we tag and bag them, take pictures of what's left, um, and then we give a nice little report to the submitter, and if it passes, all you have left is the, uh, the non-biodegradable tape that marked it, because we can't find them if we don't mark them. Um, and uh, if, if it doesn't break down at least 90% in the bioplastic realm, that's like the, the clear cups that are bioplastic, look like plastic, 
Um, those have to break down 90% and fiber products have to break down 80. Now, one thing I'm going to tell you here that a lot of people don't know is everybody assumes the bioplastics don't do as well as the fiber. We're finding the opposite. Fiber materials are treated with a lot of stuff. And they're also very, you know, the reason you can put a big old thing, a teriyaki that's heavy in a thing and put it in the fridge and everything is it's really sturdy. But we're finding that those materials don't break down well. So we're, look, we're really encouraging new material development and, and hybrids of materials that would break down better. But I know there's just this knee-jerk reaction that fiber is always better. And composters actually feel more comfortable with it. And yeah, it looks more like soil. But we found a lot of the bioplastic have been designed to actually work really well. In fact, our positive control in every test is a clear NGO PLA compostable plastic. It's not a fiber material. We tried every fiber control we could. That's the only one that consistently passes. So who knew? You learned it here today. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, I always say we're list makers. So we make lists that speciate out to those processes for those materials. They've already met the lab standards. They met our field standards. Then they get on our big list. And everybody's really happy. And those lists are used by the cities, the counties, the haulers the composter, so everybody shares that information across the U.S. Uh, based on that process. Um, why is that important? I like to show this. We were actually commissioned by NatureWorks. They're a PLA resin supplier to do a study uh, audit at University of Washington. When you take the food fragment out of their organics collection program, front of the house, back of the house, 92% of what's left is single-use packaging. So if you think about that, 92% of their single-use packaging is getting composted. It's not going to landfill at the University of Washington, which is a lot of single-use packaging. Um, they also have the advantage, especially in the Seattle area, where you know you have good uh, economics for composting as well. So there, there, it's, it's definitely. It's, I wouldn't say it's it's cheaper once you add more containers, but it's definitely par. And um, they've done just an excellent job there with their program. But that's, that's, you know, compelling. The other thing we really like to locally promote is the Taco Time One Bin System. I'm sure you guys have all gone there. We did a, a big uh, outreach thing at the Washington State Recycling Association once and just brought all the municipal outreach people and a lot of folks together. And we just, you know, really, we're really promoting this One Bin System. What does that mean? If everything is certified compostable in a restaurant and you only have, I think the only thing they have are the kids' meals. They have these little containers on top of the bins for kids' meal wrappers, but everything else compostable or durable, durable's better, um, then there's no confusion with the public. You'll notice it's all brown marked. We, could, we started that at Cedar Grove and we're really promoting that nationally um, so people know, and it looks like soil. <laughs> Um, so it has the brown color, um, but they invested, you know, they had a 0.2% per, increase in their operating costs to put this in, but their revenues went through the roof and they still are because they started the, the composting program and they raised prices three times and, and the, their business still grew. So it's a great story, great, great case study if you guys ever want to read it, but there's other ways you can be sustainable and also have a good story business-wise, and that's why we like to promote this system whenever we can. Finally, I just talk about some legislative change. Again, we have a, a climate change bill that just passed here. It does have a section in it for labeling compostables, um, which really helps us. Um, um, there's EPR bills now hitting, environmental producer responsibility bills. One of the things we're really banging the drum on is they're so used to funding big sorting systems though, composters are getting left out for funding. So anybody involved in legislative work, it would be really great to make sure that composters also are considered if we want cleaner systems and more food scrap and, and, and more tolerance for compostables. Um, and then again, food scrap bills to landfills are increasing. That's increasing interest in compostables. Um, plastic reduction bills, single-use packaging bills in both Canada and Washington State, and infrastructure bills are a big talk, and there's lots of interest nationally for building more infrastructure with composting. So 
all this stuff is going on right now and compulsibles are part of all of it. And finally, I would just like to point out, unrelated to compulsibles, you know, why we have issues. You know, think about the amount of plastic around food now, okay? You didn't get that little one inch tasting size piece of cake in a dome to take home 20 years ago. You, you like made it and then you cut it up and shared it with your neighbors, right? <laughs> But you, the tasting shows have influenced us. It's a culture of convenience. I know a lot of young moms and dads are grabbing dinner, the chicken and everything at the store, the salad bag. Think about all that, right? It's all got plastic. It's all got stuff around it. And that's increased. And it's around food. So if we're taking food scraps, and there's lots and lots statistically a lot more plastic around it, we have a lot of work to do to fix this. So one of the things I like to point out is lookalikes hurt us. In our state, a produce bag cannot be green or brown if it's not compostable on a spool because we helped influence that. The solid waste leaders in and around the states influenced that to make sure we could have a better system for the consumer. Um, you know, putting strawberries in a plastic cup now. Can you just grab them? throw them in your bag. You know what I mean? It's just, there's so much. You guys know. I don't need to tell you what. But anyway, the English cucumbers, you know, they've got the, the plastic on them now. That's great LCA for, for preserving food, but it's the bane of a compost or the existence if that goes through a shredder and then you get a little piece of it in your yard and then you're not happy anymore. So these are things we work on and, and I'm also working really, really high up the chain to try and get compostables to be part of the solution. Does any of these categories you see? Uh oh. Yeah, we're reconnecting. Yeah, we're reconnecting. Okay. Maybe it's our demos here. Just happened. Um, any of these things that you see, um, they, they we need a solution for it. We got the consumers are confused, they're frustrated, and we're trying real hard to be part of um, designing a better system in the future. Um, bags. Bags are regulated now where you can't have a green bag in our state again that looks like a compostable bag. Okay, and this all happened, I will say, that we had someone visit the site years ago, and I kept seeing the green film in all the piles, and that's when we found out it was produce bags. And I always go, do a fridge check, you know? Do a fridge check. If you go to the fridge and look at things you could toss that didn't quite make it to the end, um, what, are, what are the things we should get compostable? Fruit stickers, for sure. They're the worst contaminant of composters all over the country. There's some that are made, they're available, but they don't have scale, right? They don't have enough market for them yet. So we're really trying to push that. Uh, but the piles told the story. That's what I like to say. The piles will always tell you the story of what you should work on next. Uh, that led again to a Seattle ordinance that grew to be a statewide ordinance for color marking compostables and making sure we color regulate bags because they're such a big contaminant. So at the end of the day, close of this is we just want to protect everybody's investments. Folks like you, they're working hard to, you know, become more sustainable and create that zero waste community. Um, we need composters, people to, we, we want to cut we want to protect the investment of composters that put a lot of capital. It's a capital intensive business, you guys, and it's getting harder and a lot more expensive to site and permit than it ever was. So it's really expensive. <laughs> um, cities and haulers that are working on their solid waste programs, the great outreach people we have in this state, we have the best in the state. We really do. Uh, but all the work they need to do, we need to give them the right tools and the right solutions. And then the product manufacturers, again, you know, if we want to be in business long term and create zero waste and work on this together, we've got to have a dialogue. So that's what we try and do at CMA. And it's been a thrilling ride and we really enjoyed it. So that's the presentation on compostables and I'm happy to answer any questions. Wow. I've got a question. Yes. You talked about bioplastics and how they're preferable. Decomposition to fiber waste. So, bioplastics, can you just talk about what exactly bioplastics are and how they differ from normal plastics? Yeah, I think, 
Yeah, terminology is is kind of syncing up in different areas. So bioplastics to me, are, it's just they're plant based. Generally, that just means plant based. And to call it a bioplastic doesn't necessarily mean it's compostable. So it's bioplastic first. So like biodegradable is not necessarily compostable. Bioplastic is not necessarily compostable. So in the bioplastics realm, a lot of the R and D is going to compostable bioplastics. So when I say that, they're compostable bioplastics that work better in, that in our tests that we've seen in a lot of cases. Um, and I'm not saying all fibers don't. I'm just saying that there's a knee-jerk reaction that they don't, and, but we haven't seen that same reaction. So when you make plastics out of plants, you're still making polymers of polyethylene and polystyrene so there are co-binders and things like that, I understand, that are in there that have some petroleum. similar in yeah. the chemistry nature, but for some mm -hmm. reason, some bioplastics that are made in plants do decompose better than the ones made in the petroleum. Right. And, and yeah, the, the confusion there seems to be pretty huge, and if we could <coughs> fix that, yeah, I agree. And I think, again, not being a chemist, and you know, I've had to, I've had to learn one thing at a time. Like, we didn't know anything about packaging 15 years ago. And, and so we learn as we go, because we don't make packaging. But I think, um, to your point, um, the chemistry, what we really look at, does it biodegrade in nature in the lab? And that's kind of our, that's our, that's our task. To tell it, it, but back to, but is there any petroleum co binders? You know, I just don't have enough knowledge of the chemistry to know is it a little bit, is it a lot, is that a problem? But I agree, you know, plant based and petroleum, um, hopefully, we can go 100% plant based and they'll, they'll, we can get that technology figured out. So, to put you on the spot, um, do you think? that it might be possible for us as a society to be able to use uh, a truly biodegradable plastic in all our product, in all our packaging, and therefore avoid single-use plastic. Boy. That's my dream. <laughs> well, I think from my perspective today, is if you make everything compostable, we don't have the capacity to process it all. And understand that composters, much like making bread, they have a recipe. So that recipe needs to be consistent enough to make that consistent product you want. So I think everything being compostable is probably not doable with the infrastructure we have now. But I'm working with some really young entrepreneurial visionary kids that are starting the composting world. And I think they're going to figure out stuff our generation never did. They're just a lot more open-minded. And I always talk to folks, you know, those of us in the solid waste system for 30 years or more, you know, it, you get really, you know, I helped build that. So you can't change it. It works this way. And I'm seeing that kind of blow up a little bit. I think it's got to be less about waste management and more about how do we design communities to be sustainable. Communities, right? I've been in a lot of circular economy and design meetings and, you know, everything. And I think it's more about how do we envision our cities and build them to be sustainable versus this sort of one-size-fits-all system that has failed us in a lot of ways, I think. But it was the best we could do and it was great. So, um, but I think compostables, we can increase compostables use to solve some of the contamination problems, like the deli and the chicken, you know, the hot chicken. If that were compostable, we put the old chicken in, we get a lot more food scraps. Um, we, it could also be thrown in with the, with the package. So, but I think there's a long way to go. I think compostables will be one of many strategies, but, but the bioresin things that we do, it, it, there will also be a big recycling component, I think, that we have to consider. Who drives the decisions about how to make a package and uh, what's in it? The consumer. I think what consumers want, the brands all rush for, right? So sustainability is top of, I mean, I've been in the sustainability field my whole career, but it's just now consumerism-wise, 
it's just, it's huge. You know, people will make buying decisions now that aren't as based on price and more about environmental stewardship and is this going to be bad for the planet? You know, I have a millennial son. He's, he's much more, he's reading every label on everything he buys at the store and he cares about what he buys and what's in it. So, um, that's, that's what I would say on that. So, but where does the, where does that muscle, how does that reach the people who are producing the packaging? I mean, you know, I buy, I shop for certain things in certain places because I know the packaging I'm going to get is going to be better. I love Trader Joe's foods, but I hate their packaging. Right. Um, and so I have to look for it somewhere else. Um, so how do you build a political, um, you know, it's tough because it's a complex, right? It's system. It's a system that's really complex, and we're challenged with it too. Um, it's it's a tough one. I wish I could answer it for you, but I, I think I think what we're doing now, when a brand wants to go out and make a compostable toothbrush, for instance, like why, yeah. right? Then they come to us and go, why? No comp. Oh, really? I think we save big brands millions of dollars to not go down a stupid road, right? So we, we are trying to advise them, food scraps are why we take packaging, right? We should use durables, we shouldn't have single-use plastics, that's our position. But if you do have a concert, or you're gonna use it in the schools or whatever, we gotta have a system that works. Mm -hmm. So, but I, there's big conversations through, you know, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, Closed Loop Partners is spending a lot of time that they're investing in kind of new whole models. Um, but I'm feeling like we're in this whole rearrangement thing right now where, where the big players are starting to get where they should be leading things like what, what, what should we produce and not produce in the future. But right now, I, think, I just feel like, you know, there's, there's just too much. I, I don't see a consumer movement for this. I think like a, it seems like a sort of a more of, it's driven more by uh, legislation and, and that sort of thing instead consumers actually well i think in all fairness to consumers they don't know what the next right thing is you know they don't know is it recyclable is it compostable should i and i and i feel like that's because we don't it's hard to express where we should go next consumers don't know i think the consumers care a lot about things like that but i think it's going to take one big brand one big major scale brand to just figure it figure out how it, it, it works best. And, you know, things like Whole Foods limiting the amount of plastic on the shelf, that is one thing they've done. So they're pushing innovation in those consumer retail products that you're talking about. But it does take time. So hopefully we'll be part of the solution. Yeah, I, I think it does. Sorry, but I, I do see uh, that sort of communion between uh, more like the retailer. So it's at the street level that that consumers are influencing what's going on. Right. But uh, in order to, to go beyond that, it, it, you know, it, it has to become more systemic. Well, and that's the thing, and that and what choices it has to be more systemic than individuals making choices. I, I agree, and what's a challenge, I think, even with legislation that we've seen, is that it's really hard to explain it to an elected official, like. Where's the touch point that would make the difference, right? Because it's really complex. Like, we're part of a very complex system of managing our waste. And, and there's a lot of competing agendas. So I, I, think, I think we're having those conversations, too, exactly what you're saying. We're feeling that, too. But, but we don't know how to get the, what the consumer needs and wants in into a, a vision for the future in a system that works. So that's I think we just have to revision revision everything really. So along that line, uh, I, I know that either number, two, number one or two and and number four, well number four is is garbage, and cottage cheese always comes in number four, potato salad always comes in number four. Why can't they come in number one and two? Isn't that? I know. Uh, but I, it's the same with every brand. 
And there must be some reason why, why they use this number four stone. Yeah. I don't know. And, you know, and every jurisdiction is different. I mean, when all of our recycling quantities went overseas, we lost a lot of our domestic processing recyclables here. And so, out of sight, out of mind. So, what I'm hoping is because of the painful reality that, you know, a lot of contracts had materials going overseas and then they cut us off and we were like, whoa, we can't recycle anymore. I think that is going, that is pushing innovation and investment in domestic recycling systems. So I think you're going to see that coming, coming back where we need to keep control of our own stuff here. And, and I think that's just the fallout of, of not having the care by doing it in our domestically, um, in my opinion. You know, once it's on a barge, I don't have to worry about it. But if I got a mountain of cottage cheese containers over there, I might want to figure out what I'm going to do. You know, I, I don't know. I'm not a recycling expert um, on that piece, but that's just my feeling, seeing a lot of contracts and movement with a lot of solid waste programs. So since a lot of our restaurants on the island uh, buy compostable takeout containers yep. that they give away to their customers, and yet on the island we can't compost them because no. of our seaweed grow <clears throat> limitations. Now, what's the easiest way to get seaweed grow to accept these, even if some of these items are certified CMA high? Well, I mean, I don't represent them, but if you were shipping to them, they take our list that we've tested at their site. And so anything on our list, which is thousands of items, can be used. But for some reason, King County Transfer Station that accepts our organic waste will not accept the compostable material. Oh, they won't at the transfer station? The transfer oh, I did. I'm sorry. I'm just getting plugged into what's going on here. Yeah, okay. So it's, it's, a, it's sort of a double whammy. Mm. You know, we we limited it. Yeah. Hmm. So, have you ever heard of that? Yeah. It's partly we're, we're unincorporated, so we're literally one percent of uh, the county. Because the okay, because you're unincorporated, but you're still in King County. Okay, gotcha. Uh, but we don't. We therefore don't have all of the services that incorporated King County areas do. We don't have third bank. Uh, it's it. Uh, it much less of any mandatory. Right. Uh, and we uh, also, we now have what was a pilot and has now been uh, uh, permanently established as a transfer station. At least we have a place to take our green, uh, our, our yard waste, our wood waste, uh, and food waste, but no compostables are allowed with the food waste. Okay. So that ships directly to the King County Transfer Station who won't take <coughs> Any it, it seems to be Cedar Grove. What? Cedar Grove. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Well, really? Cedar Grove has a contract to pick up our organic waste and take it to Cedar Grove. <laughs> the, stick, the sticker seems to be sticking point. Okay, I, I, I'm just out of the loop on it. I, I really don't know enough, and, uh, but it's good for me to know that. So if there's anything helpful, I can come back to your group if I will. Because, yeah, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of that. So Terry Sullivan on Zoom has a couple. Okay. So, if you missed, of course, we had a Zoom glitch. <laughs> and uh, uh, the last part of the last couple of slides, we lost. Um, and he didn't hear it when we were reconnecting. Okay. okay. Uh, but he, he asked if the solutions are mostly known, what incentives do manufacturers have to participate? And is it a regulatory problem mainly or mainly a logistical problem? With compostables? With compostables. So the first question was? Are solutions mostly known? Most solutions, mostly known. Solutions to, I guess I don't have. So Terry, could you, uh, could you, I can't hear you, Terry. We, we can't hear you, Terry. Yeah, and so just keep you working. Uh, maybe you can type in what solutions you're talking about, Terry. Yeah. And you want to try the second question, Steve? Yeah, what incentives do manufacturers have to participate? 
Mm-hmm. What we're finding that once they understand there's a composter at the end of their cup mm-hmm. journey, they have a lot of incentive to participate because I tell them this, I'm creating a network to build your market in. I, there's so many composters that won't take packaging that CMA is the only way in. And I, 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 may, I say that not in arrogance, but because I come from 30 years in the solid waste system and we know how to do it with the composters we work with. So now that they understand that all programs are hyper-local, like your own, that you're, these are really communities everywhere. Wow. <laughs> um, and I, I encourage them to be on the SWACs. I go, go join, go sit in on a SWAC meeting if you can. I think you can. Learn about your solid waste system. So I right now I feel like we're at the very beginning, tender baby stages of the supply chain, understanding who's on the end of their cups. And and we are seeing a lot of engagement and interest in having us help them navigate that. So So is there legislation needed to help the whole process? Oh yeah. Yeah. So what would what would be your top list for legislation to, to facilitate the whole compostable? Boy, that's that's one I'd have to ponder a bit. Um I think not a lot okay, so I think not allowing I, I, originally we were going to say compostables only in Seattle for food, food scrap collection container, but there's some companies that are in Seattle that really wanted the recycling part. So the minute we did that, we created a system where if recyclables and compostables in a dining food service operation are there, you're going to downgrade both. And that's why Taco Time's story is so compelling, because they said, we're just going to have one bin, not three, one. And when you have that one bin and you get all the products that are appropriate for that one bin, it really is a simple system. So um, I would say, you know, not mixing packaging legislation to to include compostables and recyclables, which got done earlier on, would be one. I think a lot of the legislation we've already doing with the color marking is good. Plastic bag bans huge. You know, if we could ban plastic bags in every city, that'd be a a big, when you're netting out a lot of plastic that ends up in compost. Because think of it this way, most contamination in compost is coming from the grocery store. It start, You got it from the grocery store. The sticker on the zucchini, the produce bag. I would love to see, and this isn't legislation as much as education at the grocery retail level, where they could be the educators for every citizen. It's an area of influence, they keep coming back. And we can educate at the grocery stores, you know, don't put this in your compost. Don't, you know, this is a, this you can. I mean, there's just, I have a million ideas, but they just don't all connect really well, eloquently all the time. But. Are they making compostable stickers? Yeah. There's a guy in Chicago. Spent his whole career trying to make a more sustainable label. In, in general, uh, hopefully one of the solutions is something called extended producer responsibility. Yes. EPR, check it out. Oh yes, uh, good point. The state is getting very serious towards building a system where the producer is responsible for the whole waste stream associated with EPR. And I think litter tax too. Litter, and, you know, a piece of plastic and compost is litter to me. Let's get some of that litter tax to help clean, get some education upstream. But education upstream too would be my choice, but I will give you the floor back. Okay. Um, all right, so we can probably have more questions after, but um, we were just going to wrap this up, and um, there is um, an opportunity to go. Um, can I sit there? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, to go to our local compost facility or at the food club, <laughs> not facility. <laughs> um, I'm being um, optimistic here, but um, is Glenn here? Is, right here. Oh, okay, you're Glenn. He's going to um, host us at the food club location. And Ken, too. Ken, Ken. Oh, and Ken. Okay. And uh, 
So, but um, just a few more things. So, Zero Waste Valshan's intent is to provide um, recommendations to restaurants, organizations, grocery stores, um, on uh, vetted compostable products, which we have on that table here. Those are um, products that are um, made at Cedar Grove and they have their, <clears throat> their um, rating on it, which is um, CMA-I, I think, or yeah. Okay, and um, so, so it would be great, like, if we could generate some interest um, with our restaurants, you know, organizations, individuals, um, you know, maybe um, using that vetted line on the island. Um, yeah, so encourage these product vendors to carry these vetted products in bulk, which I know is hard with the supply chain right now, but um, it, is, it is something we can um, kind of aim for. And then, um, and, you know, uh, until the time when we do have a compost facility that does accept these products, um, whether it be at the transfer station or otherwise, um, that time will come. And um, we, it's best to use these products because they're not petroleum based and they're not plastic. So um, I think that's it for now and we can uh, plan to go to the, um, where is it? Sunrise Ridge. Sunrise Ridge and um, I guess, Caravan out there? supposed to be part of the discussion, too. At, um, well, okay, so that, this would be, what we've talked about is for industrial uh, composting, um, and so um, we could talk about it and how it would relate to an individual compost facility, but you have a couple of methods of um, composting that you're gonna talk mm -hmm. about. So. Uh, and I thought I'd give a brief presentation and follow it up with a group discussion. It could go anywhere people wanted to. Right? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Combustible is what I mentioned. Susan, are, are you going um, to uh, potentially go to the. Um, sure. Sure. Absolutely. If right. That's cool. All right. Yeah, we can continue to ask questions great. about, you know, how compostable. So. So what? Did you say combustibles or the combustible stuff? Yeah. Combustible. Oh, yeah. combustible. I didn't get that again. Okay. What, what do you mean about combustibles? Yeah. Your uh, category two collection. Oh, option two. two. So option two at option the styrofoam yeah. recycle is used to make alternative fuel or cement up at Macquarie right. Beach, Columbia. So, do you, do you know about that? Well, I just store in the Seattle program. That's why. We're, oh, sorry. So DTG is the, the company that takes our option two off of the island, and it, and it gets shredded up, and they use it to, to make fuel for the cement plant. It generates less CO2 than hog fuel. Uh, it burns at such high temperature, there's no polyphenols or toxic chemicals that are released. And all the ash waste goes into the clinker. So there's no waste at the end. So we think it's a better solution than taking the plastics to the landfill. These are unrecycled plastics. And, um, and now they're even separating and accepting PVC pipe. <laughs> as, as a new so old log chairs can go in there? Old log chairs, yeah, <laughs> pockets, you know, any broken, any, any beach plastic, any beach plastic. And sheets of uh, black plastic? Yep, sheets of black plastic from uh, garden, um, tarps, hoses. You would not believe that. The only thing that they don't accept is fiberglass. <laughs> but pretty much all of the plastics that are not recyclable at the transfer station, we will accept in uh, option two. Now, and it's not even building materials. And, and you're accepting a certain amount of food scraps in it too? We don't. Have food scraps, um, but if, if it's dirty, dirty plastic is fine. It doesn't have to be washed or dried or anything. And, and, and the little plant pots? Yep, little plant pots. Mm -hmm. All the different weird plant pots, the just, you know, crazy stuff. 
Now that's a lot. Just the bee bags. Saving, or, saving up for the landfill. Yeah, yeah, it's insane. I mean, we're taking, we're hauling off two 45 yard containers a month <laughs> of option new plastics. Plant pots, uh, if clean, are exactly. Yeah. They will pick them, I think, at a lot of the nurseries around. But so not only that, you want to keep put them in your, in your uh, uh, recycling. Okay. okay. Are they, are, they don't even seem to have ones or twos on them, though, do they? Uh, I've been told uh, by, by our hauler. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And one of the years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, the way I understand it, uh, they are now, uh, I think, we've been mandated by the state and they have to be recycled. Because it was such a big problem for quite a while, obviously. Yeah. Nancy just said plant pots can be recycled at the transfer station. Oh. All right. Well, cool. thank you for coming. And yeah. Yeah. Vacation. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I guess in the Yeah, let's. We're not going to go. Yeah. Do we need to help put the chairs away? Thank you, guys. Me? I'll come back and steal some of those pears. Yes. I love pears. You know, um, if you say it, you can get me out. He thinks it's a toy. Sure. Well, welcome to uh, the Fruit Club Orchard. Uh, I'll introduce myself and then give a short presentation and open it up for questions and general discussion. Uh, I should admit right off, I'm not a scientist, uh, nor am I an expert on composting, but I like to call myself a compost enthusiast. But um, truth of the matter is I'm more of a compost nut. Uh, as an example, seven years ago I moved down to Vashon from uh, Juneau, Alaska. And I had a container I was filling up with uh, rocks and other things, and I actually took two big containers of my compost. You know? <laughs> People that bought my house weren't really nice of the, uh, so I'm going to leave them anything. <laughs> and the That's other thing, great. if uh, you think it's hard growing compost down here, it's really hard in the last getting it to heat up. Uh, so my first compost uh, pile I did was probably over 40 years ago. I, I read the, uh, or skimmed through the Rodale composting book. Uh, I have to admit that I never really read it from cover to cover until a couple of years ago. Uh, and then Ken Miller, who's not here, he's uh, been kind of my mentor, giving me some good sites to read, scientific papers about composting. So I've learned a lot just uh, from Ken. Ken, the one that originally put this compost system together, we're, we're going to be upgrading it this summer to something like, uh, I don't know if you can see this picture, but I'm going to put in some cedar posts and uh, wire. Uh, get rid of these uh, pallets. I know those of you that may or may not know this, but uh, come to find out some pallets could have pesticides in them. And there's a way to find out. There's a numbering system on each uh, pallet, but boy, it's hard to find it. And, I just decided let's get rid of them and do something a little uh, more sustainable. So yellow cedar uh, uh, is something that will last many, many years, more than red cedar even. Um, all right, what can I say next? So uh, the first step is when people uh, throughout bring the stuff from other parts of the orchard. I don't know if any of you know that this uh, plant is called, commonly called quack grass. Uh, and what I was doing when I took the compost uh, files over from Ken, I was just putting them into the compost, and they come to find out they'll live through uh, most composting, unless you can get it really hot, and I'm not always successful in getting uh, it hot. So what I've been doing now is putting it over here, and this will dry out during the summer, so by fall, most of it will be dead. So then it can go into the compost. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, when we have piles like this, we sift it out and then uh, with the soil here, that goes into the uh, layers of the compost. And uh, I have two major kinds of compost we're making here and then a hybrid of the two. So I'll explain uh, each one. Uh, 
what I call garden compost is uh, something you might want to do at home where you want to get the heat up. Uh, so that's what's being explained right here. So layers of uh, you know brown and greens like you would normally, but heavier on the greens. So you want it to heat up. Uh, it is aerobic, so we turn it. At least the top, we're able to turn it. And then, um, I don't know, what do they say? Uh, I've got some handouts here I should hand out, too. I think it's 25 to 1 is what we're aiming for as far as the uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio. Uh, and so, right now, I'm not really successful. I'm up to 90 degrees, but this should get up to 140, 160 once we really get going. So, um, come to find out, at least from uh, one author, Michael Phillips, I don't know if any of you know about him, but he wrote a book called The Holistic Orchard. He's trying to do things holistically without pesticides, without chemicals. And uh, he's recommended uh, for orchards, what he calls orchard compost. Uh, and that's got a carbon ratio of 40 so much higher levels of leaves, uh, bark, uh, ramiel uh, wood chips. Uh, and ramiel wood chips are made from mostly deciduous uh, plants. Maples or trees or alders are the best. And probably, you know, no more than this thick of a branch. You chip that up. Uh, and that, come to find out, the scientific studies have shown that uh, highly, highly good for plants, especially orchards. Uh, so it's an uh, anaerobic system. So that's what I've got going here. So you just pile the different layers here and you leave it alone until next year. And if uh, this is a bit of a finished compost if you want to see the difference. And so it's more of a fungi dominated. And you can actually see some of that white mycelium in there. Um, so the, what I call garden compost, that's more of a bacterial dominated system. So this, uh, you just go for uh, length of time rather than uh, uh, the heat. So looking at the difference, here's some finished uh, garden compost and you don't see any mycelium in there. So I thought mycelium liked oxygen. Um, I don't know about that. Yeah, I, I thought they needed, they were aerobic. Not Could be, but uh, according to Michael Phillips, anyhow, he huh. developed the system for the orchard compost. Something to look into further. Yeah. Uh, the mycelium sure is doing well at the bottom of this yeah. pile. Here. Huh. So, um, I guess I could leave it there and uh, questions or open it to discussion. So you do layering over here? With oh, that's uh, probably good. That was my um, the third type of compost, which is a, a bit of both. So I don't um, I don't turn this, but I put uh, uh, probably more greens than I would in the orchard compost. But I also put the ramiel wood chips. Uh, and a little bit up the, about the ramiel wood chips is uh, Ken sent me to a couple of articles, uh, mainly done I think in eastern Canada. But uh, I guess it's just uh, such a good thing that some people are even saying, don't bother with compost, just put the ramiel wood chips down on your, your well, orchard. What is ramiel? Uh, again, it's um, small branches, okay. probably no more than about this thick of deciduous uh, trees. And I guess it's the uh, materials in the cambium layer are really, really good for um, the plants. So a lot of the wood chips you see on this island have laurels in them, which probably aren't the best, and uh, evergreens. I understand anything, if it decomposes long enough, is good for compost, but if you don't decompose it long enough, it's probably better to go with the, uh, what they call ramiel wood chips, which are the uh, deciduous trees. So can you, are you stacking uh, alder twigs in parallel? Uh, yeah. Exactly, and uh, so for this one, which is the a bit of the bowest, I'll sprinkle those on the uh, layers uh, along with the greens and the browns. I do more greens here than browns, but 
I'll put the Ramiel wood chips in it. In the um, uh, what I call the uh, garden compost, I, I don't usually put um, the wood chips in there because the idea is to get it to burn quickly and and decompose quickly. How do you spell Ramiel? R A M I A L. Let's make sure I got that right. Um, R A M I A L. And uh, the other thing I should add is we get a lot of signs here. It's a little confusing, but we worked with Sandra and Noel to come up with a, a sign that will replace all these signs that uh, talks about other ways to uh, improve your soil besides just compost. So come back later in the summer and that will be done, as well as uh, we're putting up some more permanent signs and finishing up the kiosk out there. And uh, I have to admit that uh, I have uh, a lot going on in my life. I have six compost piles at home oh, wow. and uh, I'm working on a sign project here and building this kiosk and I don't think I have any time to do anything else. I look at people like Steve, his name's on absolutely everything. And I don't know how he does it. So do you physically do this to get the dirt off? Well no, here's how I do it. I would just do it. Uh... And that's enough to... Well then I let it dry, it's really wet right now. But, uh, and then when it gets down, uh, you know, mostly so it's not going to live in it. Do you ever use things like leaves or um, leaves? Leaves or seaweed? Uh, I use leaves a lot. Uh, seaweed I use a little. Technically, you should have a permit to be collecting that. Um, but yeah, I love seaweed. It's got a lot of nutrients that you don't get anywhere else. But absolutely, leaves and um, our layers and both of these composters. I'm sorry, with the wind, I can't hear you. You're, you're sitting grass, um, uh -huh. actually kills all the roots in one It season. does, yeah. It's and what about uh, some of the yeah. invasive stuff, like uh, you see the, 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 yeah, I the rain and yeah. those kinds yeah, of Yeah, well that, I can kill on the regular compost. I can kill everything except some of those grass roots. Okay. Rhizomes just seem to live through anything. Uh, buttercup? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, yes. I put buttercup in my regular compost. And as long as you get it hot enough, it'll kill the seeds. Where can I drop the truck load of... Pardon me? Where can I drop the truck load of weeds? Of weeds. <laughs> Yeah, yeah if I have a. Uh, for weeds, we'll bring you something. <laughs> I'm trying to think what the temperature is. I've got it written here somewhere, but it's uh, leachy. So a week of 130 degrees will kill most weeds. Seeds 145, and a month will kill them all. Um, but it's hard sometimes to get it up to speed. This is only 80 something right now. Uh, that will come up uh, higher. And, I aim for 140 to 160 degrees and try to kill those weed seeds. So is that mid middle of summer or August that will get hot enough for that? Or yeah, or I don't yeah. know why it's sometimes it's harder than other. It's just maybe I don't have enough greens in there, is what I'm mm -hmm. thinking. Is it the weather? I'm wondering how much that is because it is later in the season I'm always more successful. Yeah. Oh, the other thing I put in uh, compost are um, coffee uh, yeah. grounds from the local roastery. And then um, the coffee itself is actually a green, not a brown. Uh, it's not acidic like everybody seems to think. You get on the internet and you'll be uh, taught by many people that it's acidic. Don't put it in your compost. It's not. Um, when it drains the, you know, the hot water through it, it pulls out the acidity. And it's more of a green, but the uh, flight, uh, filters are brown, so they're like leaves. Huh. I've been putting our coffee grounds on the blueberries, thinking that it was acidic. Right. Because right. <laughs> well, I believe the internet. Yeah, you look at the internet, and most of it's going to say that, but I found a few articles that just say don't believe any of that. We've tested it, and it's not. That's what I've heard, too, because they ask if they'll come out when you're making coffee. You've heard that, too, yeah. It, it's really hard uh, uh, when you do this, uh, any kind of research, because what do you believe and what do you don't believe? Because a lot of times it's like black and white. And 
So, so what's this bin over here? Uh, that's the hybrid of the two. So I put the Ramiel wood chips in there, but I try to keep it more greens than browns. And how, how do you obtain your Ramiel wood chips? Do you um, have a grinder? Yeah, I have a, a chipper. So. A chipper. Yeah, I do myself because uh, you can find sometimes chips on the island, but again, they have laurel in them, which uh, and I don't know how bad this is, but it's got a little bit of, um, what is that bad chemical that smells like uh, almonds? Help me. Oh, arsenic. Not arsenic. Okay. Cyanide. Cyanide. <laughs> Cyanide. Oh, there you go. Wow. I'm not sure how much it has in there, but if you ever crush up a... The berries? Uh, laurel, laurel, no, the berries. leaves itself. Oh, you yeah. can smell oh, all really? yeah. Yeah. Like almond. Yeah. But what I read is if you let that sit long enough, that all goes away. So, so this brings up a really good point. The feedstock that goes into compost. You know, what should we not be putting in our compost pile? Uh, <laughs> well, that's a good question, and. Uh, I don't know that I know the answer, of it, but I know what to put in it, so that's what I, uh, I mainly do. I should add something about the uh, compostable containers. Uh, I don't know if I didn't have it hot enough or what, but I tried a, a test a couple of years ago and buried them. Came back a year later, and they were all there. So I don't know if they needed more uh, heat or what, but so I don't put any of that in there. Even if you ground it up and... Now maybe if you grind I'm it up. I'm thinking yeah. that the whole shredding and grinding well, might think give more surface area. Opposite of industrial compost, I think fiber mm -hmm. does better in, in a home composting uh -huh. system just because the microbes work better. But those bioplastic have to have a certain heat to heat. break So that, that is the problem. So I, I think just more heat than yeah. surface area because, mm -hmm. yeah, because it, you just... Mm -hmm. All those materials do really well at Cedar Grove which is a really hot, fast system, mm -hmm. but they don't do as well in windrow. Right. So, mm -hmm. which is more like, you know, mm -hmm. annually. So in, ter in terms of the circular economy deal, where we're trying to get rid of all our invasive plants, if, if we ground all, chipped all our invasive plants, like blackberries and laurels and uh, ivy, is ivy a good input for the compost? Yeah, as long okay. as you don't let it grow. Well, <laughs> Poison and I ivy. Think King County generally wants you to bag it and get rid of it, only because if there's a weed seed that blows over to your neighbors. Anyway, uh, I used to be in a lot of those gardening things with them, and they really don't want you composting. Morning glory, you don't any want to put noxious <laughs> weeds. <laughs> oh really? No okay. county. The county doesn't. I, I mean, uh, that was a policy ten years ago. So with, with Ivy, what I do is just pile it, and then after a couple of years, it's. Uh, well, yeah, if you leave it there for a long time. Right. Right. Um, and then what's the other one? Scott's, uh, Scott's room. room. Oh, yeah. Uh, the problem with that is the seeds, I guess, are persistent. They live for many years. Yeah. But I went to a, a talk up in uh, Mount Vernon at the experimental station there, and one woman was saying they're the best as far as nutrients. Oh, so, really? <laughs> so, so they're nitrogen chips, really? fixing. Wow, she, uh, right, so she chips them up. and. Huh. You do have to worry about those seeds, though, because I, I understand they can last decades. But will they get composted at high temperature? Um, that would be my guess, yeah. I, I've tried it, and I haven't had any problem with it. So in the summer, when it's warmer, what, what kind of temperatures do you get out of your I If I can go 140, uh, I'm happy. 160 sometimes. That's good. Wow. That's good management. That's great. But if I can get that high, and, and like I said, I can't do everything, so uh, I tend to have mine at home a little hotter because I'm better at coming yeah. back and feeding it all the time. And I put food scraps uh, in a circular bin, and then once they're deco decomposed enough that the rats won't get at it, then I put those into my uh, one of my compost piles. So, so yeah. do you have rat problems here? Um, I saw a mouse in it once, but oh, nice. I didn't. Uh, I haven't seen a rat yet. Um, but I bet they're in here. They uh, they love fruit. They love anything. So, mm. I like Are you to call using your comfrey for um, compost? Yeah, I actually, uh, you can either just uh, mm. put it on the base and let it like sheet compost, or at the end of the season, I, I stick that in there. Yeah. Yeah, comfrey's really good. So what about fruit? What about rotten fruit? Um, yeah, we put that in our compost as, as long as it's not diseased. Uh, if it's diseased, yeah. you probably shouldn't. And same with the um, 
uh, pruning from any of the, the fruit. If it's something that looks like it's not doing well, uh, better not to put it in the compost. Because of the fungus or? Or whatever, the rust and all kinds of yeah. diseases. Yeah. Oh, and uh, speaking of the uh, peach leaf coral I was mentioning, uh, Jerry uh, Gerke, I don't know if you know him, but he built this shelter for us here. And um, there's an apricot and a nectarine. And just simple as keeping the rain off of the leaves, uh, it won't get peach leaf curl. Oh. And if you see to the left of the structure, there's um, some branches coming out. And we're doing a test there just to see what we expect will happen is that the, uh, the leaves that are exposed will get the curl, but not the rest of the plant. This is an apricot, which I don't see a lot of apricots, but normally it's covered. And this nectarine is covered also. Huh. Yeah, nectarines you can see. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's all about the apricots. You may not get a. It was so cold at the beginning, I think some of the pollinators that are usually out were out. I think I've seen one. Oh yeah, here's one right here. Yeah, it's a shame though. Okay. Normally there are a few, yeah. Yeah, you can see the difference down here because this is all it's clean like and they got curl <laughs> out there. Right, right. So, you know, that is happening. That's what we'd expected, and sure enough. So what's interesting to me is it's not something that you think of a disease as spreading everywhere. This is more because of the, the wet and simple leaves. The same plant. Wow. Yeah. Now, if you can make it back during nectarine harvest time, this this plant is delicious. <laughs> the uh, apricots are good, but they're they're not as delicious as these nectarines. If you take the picture from the right side, of the that other you can end. see the difference. Yeah. Yeah, right, right up here. Yeah. I mean, you can see it's just like a yeah, straight line. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Wow, it's like a different. Yeah, I hadn't noticed that yet. That was the yeah. prediction, and sure enough. <laughs> That's amazing. So just this amount of shelter, because, I mean, rain goes <laughs> all over. Well, in the uh, fall, it comes down. Oh, okay. There's and another one that keeps it. Oh, okay. And that's most of the time uh, you get the rain, I guess, except for the, this week. Huh? What a lot of rain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've had three inches in the last week. All right. Thank we'll, you so we'll much. We'll be having That's more open nice. houses throughout the summer. Make sure and come by and sample some of the fruit. Yeah. Good. Good. How many members here? I think about 160 maybe.